Today, I want to welcome Corey Harlock. Corey has a 15-year background in the hospitality industry. We're going to talk a little bit about that and how it honed his skills to do what he's doing now and delivering exceptional experience and um and it ended up actually for Corey being a little bit of a reinvention of life. He went from that. Now he's in recruiting and discovered the profound impact he could have on connecting the right talent with the right opportunities. Corey is a Vistage member. And if you're not familiar with that, we're going to talk a little bit about that and why that's important. And he's soon to be a Vistage speaker. Uh, fueled by his... You know, his background, he's he found a key hire to meet the unique needs of small business owners, providing them with insider organizational and talent expertise they need to uh, take, uh, they need to take their business where they want it to be. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit also about what the difference is between fractional talent and fractional HR. But uh, Corey, you know, we've known each other. Uh, for a while now, and uh, I've really been looking forward to this. Thanks for being on Leaders and Legacies. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, let's go back to hospitality. You know, now, anybody that's listening, I haven't heard I haven't heard something yet in the you know, few words that you've said, but at some point you're going to say something just right, and they're going to say, hey, he's from Canada. Correct, yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I don't readily usually admit this, but I'm from a little town outside of Toronto called Oshawa, Ontario. It's kind of famous for two things. Uh, used to have three GM factories and it's home of the Oshawa Generals hockey team, which produced Bobby Orr and Eric Lindros and a couple other big hockey names. So is it closer to Detroit or closer to uh, Toronto? Toronto. It's it used to be able to get into downtown Toronto in 45 minutes from Oshawa. You can't do that anymore with the traffic, but now it's a lunchbox community for Toronto. Yeah. Okay. And just as an FYI, it's not Toronto, it's Toronto. There's only one T in Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> Start with two, but you only pronounce one. Yeah. Interested. And so you left that and then you moved out to the Canadian Rockies. Correct. Yeah. After I graduated. So, well, I did a placement um, for my college uh, education out in Jasper, Alberta. And then uh, it was a work placement. And then um, I went traveling, did, did a little traveling in a VW van with a friend of mine through the States. Got back to Oshawa and said, man, I want to, I need to get back to the Rockies. So I headed back out there. Yeah. <clears throat> so. You know, it's interesting when I think about Canada, I think of a lot, you know, a lot of the Canadian population is close to the U.S. border. Yeah. But Alberta has, is it almost like, is it like a little channel of population that goes further north than the other provinces? Um. Well, it's not as dense for sure, but yeah, there are kind of, well, the, the, the cap, <laughs> a little geography lesson, the capital of Alberta is Edmonton, which is probably three hours north of Alberta, and Alberta is about two hours north of the Montana border. So, yeah, you're right. There's kind of two main cities, and they're they're virtually stacked on top of each other about three hours apart. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a marketer named John Spolstra. He does a lot of sports marketing. Very smart guy. I'd recommend any book he's written. He's written many. Um probably his best book is called marketing. Uh, well, I don't know. One of his better books is marketing outrageously. And one of the things that he talks about is after he got done um, building up the ticket sales at New Jersey Nets, the owner of the Edmonton Oilers uh, started calling him. And apparently his ticket sales were tanking and he had just sold Wayne Gretzky. Yeah. To and the LA Kings, yeah. Yeah, and put up a big statue to Gretzky and sold him, I think, for seventeen million or something like that. And ticket sales were plummeting. And uh, I forget the guy's name, the owner's name, but apparently, like a lot of billionaire sports team owners, uh, very opinionated, hard to hard to channel, hard to manage. Yeah, I think it was was it Pocklington at that time. I you know I can't remember. 
I can't remember. I, I know this. Uh, John told him, you know, so, you know, he paid John to come out and do kind of a look around. And John went up there and uh, he originally planned two days and it only took him one day to figure out what was going on. And he went to the owner and he said, the good news is I can fix your problem. The bad news is there's two things I'm going to ask of you. One of them, one of them you can do. The other one you can't. He's like, okay, all right, give me the bad news. He said, the first thing that you need to do is pay me a ton of money. And he laid out the, you know, the amount of money. He's like, well, yeah, I can do that. And he said, I know that that's the easy part. The thing you can't do, it's going to be hard for you is you can't talk to the press for six months. And he kind of scratched his chin and looked around. And he was like, oh, that is a tough one. You know, I've been wanting to go to Hawaii. Maybe I'll go to Hawaii for four months and that will keep me away from the press. And so sure enough, John got him to leave out uh, Edmonton and go to uh, Hawaii for four months while John rebuilt his ticket sales. Right. But so you were... Were you in Edmonton or where, where were you in? So I was in, I was initially out in the Rockies. So I was in Banff, Lake Louise, a little town called Field, BC, another town called Canmore. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's where I started kind of my um, boutique hotel hospitality career out in the Rockies, kind of trying to make a name for myself out there. Yeah. And you know, so what, what sort of hotels uh, were there? I mean, w when you say bo boutique, what does, um, help help me wrap my head around that. Yeah, so the, the company I worked for was called Canadian Rocky Mountain Resorts, and they owned um, really niche, high-end boutique hotels, you know, uh, 120 rooms, but they had what what we kind of hung our hat on was the rooms were beautiful but we had these really high-end restaurants. Um, we used to have an executive chef and he coined this phrase Can Canadian Rocky Mountain cuisine. And it was kind of all on like local stuff, right? Like elk and deer. And it, and it was designed around local fare and it was garnished with, you know, the stuff they would eat. So if you had an elk, it would be kind of maybe in a, a type of berry sauce with kind of all these different fixings. And it was, it was this holistic view and then each of the, uh, so we had three hotels and so each one had a really high end dining room and then each of them had a wine cellar. And so, uh, all the hotels had wine tech, wine spectator awards of excellence and they'd all won, you know, e e each of us, uh, director of food and beverage were responsible to manage our cellars and, uh, create wine lists. And, you know, that wasn't expected we'd win these awards, but we had some really wealthy owners who were happy to throw some money at it if we wanted to give it a run. And um, I think over my time there, I won three or four wine to sp uh, spectator award of excellence uh, with two hotels. At one point I was overseeing two hotels and I maintained one of the the awards at one hotel, but the, the hotel I ran had never won one before. And when I left, we won uh, three years in a row, we had won that spectator award of excellence. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, it was pretty, it's pretty cool to see your, your restaurant in print and the wine spectator, right? It's kind of a, it's good for the ego. Good for the ego. I'll tell you where my mind's going. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, if I'm in this, will, will uh, wine brokers be visiting me, uh, begging me to taste really good wines? Uh, constantly. 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 Like, um, so the problem, not the problem, but one of our challenges was two of our hotels were in Alberta and one of them was in BC. And when, when you cross over that border, you're not allowed to ship wine from Alberta to BC for retail consumption. So uh, we would go to wine shows and, you know, at the time of us, there were three directors, food and beverage, and we all got along really, really well. And so we would go to these wine shows. And when we walked up to the table, people knew who we were and um, we, we had blank checks. So if, if we like something and we all agreed on it, we would say like, we'll take two pallets, ship one to BC and one to Alberta, you know? And so people would, it, it, it was, um, man, I was, I was way too young and way too inexperienced to be wielding that type of, uh, uh, influence, you know what I mean? And, um, 
it went to my head, right? You, you, I mean, yeah. I, I was a director of food and beverage when I was 26 years old out there. I think I was probably one of the youngest directors of F&B out there. And I have a, you know, a half a million dollar wine cellar and I'm working in this cool place and I'm buying wine and I'm, um, so it was fun. Uh, it was fun. If I had to do it again, I probably would have done it a little differently, but it, it uh, it's something I look back on as a really good learning opportunity be, because I was living a champagne lifestyle on a beer budget, but uh, I, I I was too young and too inexperienced to understand the difference between those two. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of, you do what you do, but it was fun. Yeah. I mean, I, we used to organize wine tastings and people would drop in on us and, and it, we had, a, they cracked down on it at one point, but we, we had a lot of, um, advantages that came with being able to buy that volume of wine yeah so what's what's your funniest wine story from that time funniest wine story i don't know funny uh well okay here's one uh so we went to this thing called the vancouver playhouse wine festival which is a huge probably one of the biggest ones in canada and so the three of us went, uh, I, I will, I'll give first names only, but uh, Dave Shelley and myself went to the Vancouver Playhouse International Wine Festival. And uh, you book all these seminars, right? So the first day we're there, um, you're tasting uh, hundreds of wines. And so uh, the three of us, we really enjoyed wine. So we were not big fans of spitting out the wine. And so <laughs> we were tasting a lot of wine. And Shelly was, um, Shelly has endless amounts of energy and, and she had signed us up for a session early the next morning. And so after tasting all these wines and going out to dinner with, you know, vineyard owners and things like that, it was a, it was a long and late night. And the next morning, Dave and I are sleeping and the phone rings. What? So Dave answers the phone and he's like, uh-huh, yep, 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 we'll be right there. He hangs up and he wakes me up and he's like, we got to get going. Our alarm didn't go off. Shelly is waiting in the lobby for us right now and she's pissed because she got up and we didn't. So we like scramble to put ourselves together, run down to the lobby to get to this uh, session uh, with Shelly and she was, um, she was okay and we were not. Ah, uh, Yeah. I, I used to work for a boss like that, that um, we we were in a hotel. We were in the, uh, the sports bar at the uh, Marriott on Berliner Strasse in, in Munich. And we were getting ready for a big meeting with Siemens the next morning. And about 2 a.m., my boss, Joe, sitting there with a cigar in one hand, a big tall beer in the other. He's having a big time. I'm like, Joe, I'm going to bed. I'll see you in the morning. And uh, he's like, oh, okay. I mean, just one of these people sounds like Shelly that just could stay there's, up all night. There's no quit in here. And that's what, that's what I say. When I go back and look at it, I would have done it a little differently, right? But uh, we were there to have some fun and take advantage of our you know, quote unquote status. But uh, yeah, so. Well, you found another treasure up there, did you not? Yeah, my wife used my wife used to work for. She came as a summer employee, um, and that's where I met her. And uh, here we are, man. That was in 1999. So here we are, 25 years later, and we're married with two kids. And uh, my my joke, whether it's politically correct or not, I always just say she used to work for me. Now I work for her. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and. You left from there and you went to the Cayman Islands. That was your next gig. That's correct. Yeah. I uh, I took a summer off, did some rock climbing. And I, I think it like I had a date in my head. It was August, whatever. And I took, I you know, the internet was just kind of coming around. And I, I went and um, looked at every restaurant and everything there was in the Cayman Islands. And I said, I don't know, I might have mailed like 30 resumes down to the Cayman Islands. And then like two weeks later, my phone started to ring with some different opportunities. And I ended up uh, down in Cayman, yeah correct wow i mean and, and so that's kind of like a dream life i mean people picture that of you know work in the cayman islands you know work by the beach you know leave work go out and lay on the beach was was it uh 
Was it everything we, we dream of? No, no. Um, when you're there working, if you're a Caymanian, uh, that's life. If you're there on a work permit, I mean, the expectation is you work six days a week, you get one day off a week, and um, you it's you work when they need you to, right? They own your permit. So um, if you don't deliver for them, they just cancel your permit and they ship you off the islands. Uh, so it's 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 hard down there as an expat on a work permit working. It's it, the expectations are big, and you you work a lot, and you know you're one day off if you want to go. There's not a lot to do. You can dive and you can drink. Those are about the only and and you can hang out at the beach. But if you're at the beach, you're probably drinking. So it's uh, that's that's the Caymanian lifestyle uh, for an expat down there working. That sounds like one step away from uh, having an immigrant worker and taking their passport. It is for sure. Like uh, um, another politically incorrect joke of mine is, you know, the Caymans were founded by pirates and it's still run by pirates. They, uh, you know, I didn't work for the nicest guy down there, but yeah, they, I mean, if, if they wanted you gone, they, they would just go and cancel your permit and they would come and say, you got to go and ship you off the island. Wow. Wow. Oh my goodness. And if you didn't like the person you're working for, you had to get their permission to kind of say, yeah, I'll, I'll release you. So someone else could take over your work permit and you could go work for them. It's not like I have a work permit and I can go work for whomever I want. You have a permit to work for that employer. Yeah. That's, <clears throat> that's strict. That's rugged. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a culture based on religion and money. And so, um, the way they have it set up. I look back at like at, at the time it was exhausting. I mean, I look back fondly now because that's where really where, you know, uh, my wife at the time, I invited her to come to Cayman. She was in school. So she came down for uh, the summer and work for me. And that's kind of where our relationship took off. And and we met some people that we, we became friends with. Um, so looking back on it now, it was a good, ex it, it, I remember the 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 good parts about it, but down there when you're working, it's a real grind. Like it's it's hard work, man. Yeah. So what are you doing now? Well, well, now I I'm running key hire and trying to grow key hire, and you know we're working with small business owners so we can improve their lives and improve the lives of their employees and their employees' families, and ultimately that trickles down into the community, right? That's that's the mission of key hire. We want to make sure we're supporting small business owners so they can get where they want to go. Uh, and in turn, they can support their employees, families of their employees. And when they're all happy and being successful, you know, the community is a better place. They can spend more time and more resources in the community, making the world a better place. You know, I, I, I think you're the only person in, in the recruiting industry that I've ever heard make that connection from your work all the way down to impacting communities. Yeah, and I'm going to make a small adjustment. I'm not a recruiter. Okay, um, so here I'm. I'm confused. What What do you do? So I consult with small business owners on talent strategy, uh, constraints, talent constraints, experience gaps in their business. We look at their organizational charts, and we kind of map up. We map the the journey for them to get from. Five, uh, just throwing out random numbers. Here's what your organization looks at at $10 million and you're struggling. But if you want to get to 30, right, here's what your organization will need to look like. And here are the incremental steps we need to take in terms of talent and leadership and experience uh, and capacity to build into your business to get to 30. So 60% of the work we do is developing new roles within an organization. And then that's great. We've developed the role, but then we have to go to Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner and say, this is how we're going to integrate this role into your business. And when we integrate this role into your business, here's how your behavior might have to change because we're putting professionals with capacity and potentially more experience than you have into this part of the business. And so your behaviors have to change, right? We need to start changing the way we manage. We need to start changing the way we organize. We need to change the span of control. So once we kind of look at those things, then we do go out and acquire talent, but I'm not a recruiter. What we do is we supplement the DIY owner, right? So when DIY is not getting it done for a business owner, 
that's where we come in. We come in in source. We come in and act as part of your team. We come in and act as your director of talent strategy and acquisition. So what are some of the blind spots when you, when you just start working with somebody, what are some common blind spots that you find business owners and executives have in their talent plan? So it depends. Um, I'm going to give you a really, this could be a long answer, but uh, so in this, in the work we've done, we talk about small business owners, right? <clears throat> That's an umbrella term. And so we've really identified five, what we call our key owner stages. And this is the state of the business owner, not the state of the business. So at the, at the far left of the spectrum, we would have what we would call the overwhelmed business owner. So this could be someone who has taken over, uh, they're a generational owner, taken over a, a business from family member, and they have all these ideas and they're really implementing ideas and the business is growing or they're, 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 you know, the original business owner, but they're really growing the business. And now they are, they are overwhelmed, which means the people they brought in at the beginning. And that's like your neighbor, your cousin, your cousin's neighbor, all these people that banded together to do the work are doing the best job they can, but the, the, the requirements and the volume of the business have outgrown their experience and abilities to manage the business. So I like to say, you know, at, at this point, it's like the wheels have fallen off the machine, right? And the business owner is, is, is kind of bewildered. They're thinking, I don't know what's going on. All of these people used to be so good. And now we're all working 60 hours a week and we still can't keep up, right? So that's the overwhelmed business owner. Then as we move up the scale, we kind of move to the unsure business owner. And this is what we call the wobbly wheels, right? So this is where the business owner is, you know, not as stressed out as, as the overwhelmed business owner. They know they have a problem, but they still just can't put their finger on it. But, you know, the wheels are wobbly. They, they know there's a problem there. What do I need to do? Then the, the next phase is what we call the unsure business owner. And this is where we call it the squeaky wheel, right? So I know I have a problem. I think I know where it is, um, but I don't know what my options are and I don't know how to deal with it. Then we move further along that scale. And this is where we come to the, the um, curious business owner uh, in that, that curious, uh, sorry, the, the unsure business owner are the wobbly wheels. The curious business owner is the squeaky wheel, right? So the curious business owner is now getting to the point where they're saying, I know who's doing well and I know who's not, but I don't really know why. And then we go to the growing business owner and these are the business owners who say, I know I need more capacity and more talent in my business because we're growing and I, and I need to kind of start putting things in place to maintain growth. And then the final stage is a strategic business owner who is saying, I know what I need, just fill in the holes for me, right? Because, and, and this is like, so the growing business owner, we're upgrading the wheels. So we've gone, wheels have fallen off, wobbly wheels, a squeaky wheel, growing business owner, we're putting high performance tires on the vehicle now, right? We're upgrading those nicer rims, better tires. And then the strategic business owner is like, we're adding wheels, right? We, 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 we got velocity here. We're moving, we're traveling. We just need more traction. Yeah. And so each of those people have a different need. Um, but if we look at kind of the overwhelmed and the unsure business owner, often those are people that um, they're working with what they have and who has been with them in the beginning. And they haven't made that, they haven't changed their definition of what a good employee looks like. They, they and I, I'm always very cautious of saying anything um, that could be viewed as negative because business owners are hardworking individuals. They have a vision, they're doing the best they can. And I never wanna make disparaging comments, but, what happens is, you know, in that overwhelmed and unsure business owner, they have people they that have got them where they are. So they believe they are the right people for the job. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the business outgrows the ability and the capacity of those individuals. So they cannot, they don't have any resources to draw upon to create better 
uh, process and procedure to enable the business to grow. So they become the constraint. And our job is to come in and say, yeah, that operations manager you have that started with you 10 years ago and used to turn and work a machine and then they showed up every day and they're responsible. So you moved them to a supervisor and now they're your manager, but they have no formal training and they're they're great soldier and they work hard. They're not the person to grow your operation from 10 to 30. And so we need to redefine what good looks like and bring in professionals with the capacity and the experience to build the process and procedure to grow your business. I would guess when you have that conversation, you run into a fair number of people that are overwhelmed by their sense of loyalty for the person that got them to where they are. 100%. For sure. And they should be. How do you navigate that? Uh, it's, it's, this is what I tell them. There is no conversation or decision you will make in your business ever, ever. That is harder than sitting down that loyal soldier and saying, thank you for getting me here. I'm grateful, forever grateful to what you've done to help me, but I don't think you can get me where I need to go from here. And we have options, right? There's, there's things we can do with that person. Um, but off, they're, they're not often open to it. So we can hire someone above them to mentor them and develop them. But that's a shot to the pride for the individual often. Mm -hmm. We can give them a different seat on the bus, a new role. And that's, in my experience, typically a band-aid. Or we can help them find their next adventure. We can help them find their next opportunity and say, let's work together to see what we can do for you. Um, but the challenge can often be these people become what I call an overvalued asset because they've been there and they've shown up and they've got continually been given raises and increases. We have an employee who uh, we're just going to throw numbers out is making $100,000 a year, but on the open market, they might be worth 70 to 80. Mm -hmm. And so to move them into a new role with a new company could mean a step back. So it's a really really hard conversation and just it's a hard problem for a business owner to solve the first time but once we do it the first time and they kind of have that courage and trust to make a change and then they see what a professional person with the experience the incapacity they need to do the job once they see the impact that person has on their business that's where they really transition from that unsure business owner to the curious. That's where they start thinking, wow, if I brought in this person and they were able to do this and they were able to make all these positive changes in this area of my business, what if I look at my other leaders? And that's often the hump they need to get over. And I'm not advocating you just start firing all your people that helped to get where you are. I, I am I am termination adverse, right? I don't think that's the first option ever because these are people with lives and bills and stuff they have to do. But it comes down often to a choice, right? Like, do I want to make sure I take care of this person uh, and keep them in my business and keep paying them? Or do I want to mis move my business forward? And so we got to find that kind of, that path whatever that path is, the right path in that, that kind of skirts taking care of the person and growing the business. But often it's, it's not keeping that person in their role and just kind of wishing and hoping they can do better. One of the things you said was <clears throat> moving them into a different role in the company is typically a band-aid and doesn't work out. Correct. What's the reason for that? I don't have any scientific data to back this up, but what, what I feel like happens is um, that person feels like they have been um, given a bad deal, right? Yeah. I was doing just fine in that role and I was, I was getting there and I was going to figure it out. And now you've lost trust in me and you're bringing in this other person and you don't even know them and you know me, there's a lot of head trash that goes on in there, right? Because it sucks. It's, 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 it being on the other end of that 
it's hard to rationalize and it's hard not to be upset about that. And so we move them to a different position and often you just watch their performance go fall off a cliff because they're, they're more focused on how upset they are than they are about recreating themselves in the company and uh, proving they can do it. Um, and I've seen it a lot, right? Where we move them and then you're kind of like, you know, you follow up and like, how are they doing? They're like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And then, and then that's where the owner now is like, Hmm, I gave them a chance. There's this communication that doesn't align often, right? It's like the owner saying, I gave them a chance and I could have just walked them out the door, but I, I wanted to do this for them. And now they're not even trying anymore. And then on the, on that loyal person side, they're like, you know, I gave you blood, sweat, tears, and then you didn't even have the courtesy to give me a chance and you move me out of there. And so there's this real disconnect um, and, and there's a lot of emotion tied up to it. There's a friend, often a friendship in the, in the middle of that. Like it's, it, it's a messy situation. You know, we're both in Vestige and what we're going to talk in a minute about what Vestige is and, but the, and somebody put something out to one of the networks, you know, uh, a question and you probably get the emails like I get them. And they were talking about a similar situation where somebody who had been a loyal employee, they had promoted to a point of their incompetence right. and they were trying to figure out what to do. Right. Yeah. And they were trying to figure out what to do. And and my advice was give them three options, but make them make the choice, which of the three options they're going to take. And, and that's, that's partially because of my bent. You know, I, I think a lot about preserving people's autonomy, you know, and that's, you know, I just see powerful things happen. You know, I think about it from a sales perspective, a sales marketing perspective, the more you preserve people's autonomy, the higher your closing rate will be. You know, when you try to box them into the canyon, guess what? They realize they're being boxed in and they they try to get out. Right. What would what would be your advice? And, and if that was bad advice that I gave that person, let it out. I'm just curious. How what do you think? How much of the choice should be in hands of the individual and how much in the choice of the owner? Yeah. So I, what I think is the original choice is in the hands of the owner, right? If, and I, I don't mind giving people choice. I think I outlined three choices myself. So uh, you, you can stay in your role, but I'm going to hire someone over you, but their directive will be a, to improve the department. And they're going to do some things that you might not agree with, but also we want them to mentor you and, and give you skills so you can remain a valuable member of the team. Uh, and so the power initially is in the owner's hands. They need to come up with the right choices. So whatever the person chooses is a win for both, right? Yeah. So if you choose to, to stay where you are and let's bring someone in over you and you got to commit to working with them, that's a win for both of us. Or you can say, I don't want to be in this role anymore. I think I, I want to move. If someone else is going to come in and run the department, I just want to be out of there. Um, and so... If that's what you want, let's talk about what that role is and make that a win-win. Or if you just say, I'm done, I need to get out. Let's talk about how we can do that and work together to make sure you're successful doing that. And that's a win for both sides, right? Because the last time, the last thing you want is a kind of toxic person running around in there. And then once you give them the choice, the power goes into the hands of the, the uh, person uh, you know, in this case, maybe a leader who's kind of petered out, right? They're, they've been risen to the level of their own incompetence. And um, now they get to make a choice, but the owner has to hold them accountable to that choice. They, they, that, that's got to be a conversation around, okay, so let's talk through what this choice means. What are your expectations of me? What are my expectations of you? Because I want this to work. I, I don't want you to feel like I'm just casting you out or I don't value you, or I don't appreciate everything you've done for me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would I would tend to agree with the advice you gave. I think we're, we're aligned in that, but it needs to be more than just going to the person saying, well, what do you want? Yeah, um, yeah totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a choice with structure. It's a, a very structured choice. Correct, so, yeah. Yeah. And they might come back and say, look, I got a fourth option. Here's what I came up with. Then listen to it. If it's a win-win, 
Uh, listen, right? Because uh, there's a lot of tribal knowledge there. There's potentially a friendship there. There's loyalty there. Um, building, getting a business, building a business to the point where you have to think about replacing people because they can't handle the volume levels is is something right how many people build a business to the point where they have employees and then they get so busy they have to reconsider if those employees are the right employees like that's an accomplishment in itself and um so it's got to be taken seriously like and again i always go back to man these these are people with lives they're married they have mortgages they probably have kids in school and you don't ever want them to go home and have to tell their wife, I just got fired. Why? Well, because my, you know, my buddy thinks I can't do my job anymore. And I don't know how we're going to, you know, we got three months worth of cash in the bank and I got to go find a new job. Like that, that's, that's crappy. Um, yeah. You know, when I, when I have clients and they're like, well, we'll hire them. And if they don't work out in three months, we'll just fire them. I like, whoa, stop, stop, stop. That's not how we do business. That's not, we we need to talk about that. And if that's your attitude, I can't work with you because we're dealing with people. We're dealing with human beings with lives, especially when you're dealing with like leadership and senior leadership. These are mature people with families and lives and mortgages. And we can't have this, um, this belief system where, well, if they don't work out for me, I'll just fire them. That's that's not what we do. Like, let's let's do it correctly and maximize the probability of getting this right and making sure everyone's happy and everyone's successful versus this. You know, and that all comes down to process, like the hiring process. But if you're just hiring people to see if they're going to work out or you're just going to fire them. I, I, I would really take a look into kind of um, you're affecting people's lives and. That's a big deal. Yeah. So we, we need to be real serious, <laughs> real cautious about that stuff. Well, and I can tell you, I would really struggle you know, if you came to me and you said, Craig, this has been a loyal employee to you, to you, but they, you know, they're no, no longer right for this job. I, you know, I was emotionally and mentally kind of playing that scenario out in my own life. And especially if it was somebody that played a role in running my business when I was, in a coma yeah i'd be like i you know i that would be an incredibly hard decision for me yeah 100 uh, percent. The, the hardest decision you'll ever make yeah like running a business is easier than having to deal with people and, and having those conversations those conversations suck they're hard but sometimes we need to weigh that right and, and and this is so i've had people where we've we've had those conversations and and sometimes what will happen and this is the usual route um they'll say no no we're not changing that person but we'll go to work and do something else and bring in a professional and change their their perception of what a good person looks like and then within six months they'll come back to me and say you know, we had that conversation about so-and-so. I think you're right. Because now they're seeing what a professional looks like. Someone with the experience and the capacity to grow their business looks like against the person who's been a loyal employee and gotten them where they are, but has no more juice left, right? So they're kind of seeing this, this um, leveling of talent. And that's where they come to me and go, you're right. I think I, I don't think they're they can do the job anymore because they, they have a, they now have a, a different comp comparable. And yeah. uh, that's where I say, OK, so how do you want to deal with this? What do you want to do? And, uh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've asked this question to a couple of my clients and said to them. Since we've been working together and the people that we've worked, you know, the roles we've developed in. The, role, the people we've integrated into your business and different leadership roles. Has that, because of those people, have you changed your opinion or your vision of what a good employee looks like? 
And to a business owner, they don't even hesitate. And they're like, yes. And, and then they understand. They're like, now they're, they've been struggling with this kind of growth like this, right? And they're, it's hard. And then we put some pros in there and they start going like this. And they're at home for dinner with their family. Um, they're able to take the weekend off without anyone calling them. Their life gets easier and their business gets more profitable all at the same time. Yeah. Wow. So, that's, <clears throat> well, and that's, and that's something to hang the hat on. And it's, you know, I think um, something Jack Welsh said when he took over GE, when he took over GE, it was 400,000 strong. And he, you know, he earned the name Neutron Jack because you know, the neutron bomb, you know, it would, it would, the buildings would remain standing, but all the people would be gone. Right. And to hear his perspective, he said, look, we were a, we were a 200,000 person company that had 400,000 employees. Yeah. Yeah. That's, my, that's interesting. My job was to make sure the jobs of those 200,000 were secure. Yeah. That's, that's, the and similarly, you know, what, what I tell business owners all the time is, you know, if you're at $10 million, I say, we're not hiring and designing roles for people to run your $10 million a year company. We're designing roles and integrating leaders into your company to run a $30 million company currently doing 10. Yeah. And so that enables them to switch and go, what do you mean? Like, what, what's the difference? What do you mean by that? And that's where, you know, the biggest mistake people make is they hire for current needs. And then, so that person's capacity is limited. So say you're at 10 million and you hire someone to run a $10 million operation and you grow to 15, they're already Peter principled in, right? They're already, now they're struggling. And you're like, what's going on? They were so great. Now they're struggling. It's because they don't have the jam. They don't have the horsepower, the experience, the capacity, they're a $15 million person, right? Their experience is all at 15 million. They know how to design process and procedure to run a $15 million a year company. And that's real, right? So we want to go bigger. And so instead of chasing growth and like putting fingers and holes and band-aids on, on problems, we want to identify all those constraints and all those gaps and then build process and procedure out here that the company just kind of grow organically grows into. Yeah. You know, Corey, I, I could go on for another 30 minutes hour. This is, this is fascinating. And it, it's, you, you've challenged me and, and I'm quite sure that you've challenged others. How can people reach out to you and, and continue the conversation? Yeah, and I would love to, right? So we there's a couple of different ways we can do this. Uh, my email is uh, simple. It's Corey at symbol key hire one word k e y h i r e dot solutions not dot com Corey at key hire dot solutions. Send me an email. Uh, you can hit the website. Uh, we do have a free free conversation. It's we always say no weirdness, no sales. If, you, if you're having a talent issue or you want to talk to us, just book some time and we'll chat. Um, I'm happy to give you tools and resources to take into your business that you can implement. Um, if you like what you hear and you want to continue to work with us, we can talk about that too, but that's not the purpose of the call. They can hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, Corey, Corey Harlock, look at LinkedIn. You'll see my my ugly mug up there and you can connect with me there or our Facebook page, the uh, Key Hire Solutions face, uh, LinkedIn page. Those are probably the primary ways to, to connect with us. Well, I, I do hope people will reach out. Corey, thank you for being on Leaders and Legacies. Yeah, that's great. I've enjoyed it. Thanks so much for, for having me.